So we are here to discuss the great book called The Big Free by Dr. Martha Boone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. And I think I've muted most of you, but please remain muted during this interview portion. I'm going to ask Martha questions for probably 45 minutes or so. And then if I haven't asked the question that you want to ask her, we're going to have a, uh, a time afterwards where you can uh, put a question into the chat or we might also open up microphones. So we just appreciate all of you being here and um, hopefully all of you have read The Big Free. If you haven't or if you haven't finished it yet, you're still going to enjoy this discussion because Martha has a lot of, a lot of good things to say about her, her time at charity and about the novel writing process. Um, first, let me introduce Dr. Martha Boone. She is one of the first 100 board certified female urologists in the world and a very, very popular doctor here in Atlanta. She's always one of the top docs, uh, one of the top Atlanta doctors um, for more than a decade consistently. Her, uh, her patients have voted her into that prestigious uh, position. She did her surgical training at Tulane in New Orleans in the mid eighties. And she spent six months in a general surgery residency at Charity Hospital, also known as the Big Free. And it was that time period that inspired her novel. And I think those of you who have read it, and if you haven't finished it yet, you know that there's so much wonderful detail in the book about her time there. And, and it's clear she has such a great memory of exactly how things were. So I've loved reading that and I hope all of you all have as well. Um, Martha grew up in King Street, South Carolina and spent a lot of time in her grandparents' farm, which was also in South Carolina. And that's a really fascinating part of the book, how some of that is woven into the story. Uh, so without further ado, Martha, thank you for joining us. And um, I'll start off with asking you how much of this book, I told everyone, you know, the rich detail, how much of it is, is real life? How much of it is based upon your true experiences? Okay. So first I'd like to thank everybody for being here and thank Mary Ann for all of your efforts to make this possible. I really appreciate it. And to answer the question, the book is historical fiction. It was written around events that occurred around 1984 to 1987. It is not a memoir. So it's very loosely based on my life and my first six months at Charity Hospital. What is your favorite part of the book? <laughs> my favorite scene is the one in Commander's Palace. That scene actually happened with my mother. My mom had come to visit me in New Orleans and we went out to Commander's for dinner. And I was so exhausted from the 80 to 100 hour weeks at charity that when she came back from the bathroom, I was asleep on the table with my head and my crab ramelade and the waiter was standing over me, um, afraid to wake me up. And it turned out that the waiter, Eric, who was in that scene in the book, was actually the guy who was there the night that it happened with mom and me. And I took him a copy of the book once it was published, signed it to him, and we had dinner at Commander's and he was our waiter. So that was kind of a, a fun thing to, to go back and do. Fascinating. I love that. So that segues right into the question of how many of the characters are true real life characters, people in real life, I should say. So Dr. McSwain is himself. He's a real life character. Everybody else is kind of based on an amalgamation of different people that I had known throughout my training. Uh, interestingly enough, when I went to New Orleans, to do a couple of book signings. My fellow residents, I don't know if you remember, but in the call room, there was one good resident and one bad resident. And everybody thought they were the good resident. Nobody thought they were the bad resident. And some of the boys that I had trained with, I don't know if you remember this scene, but the scene with the Clinique soap really happened. And a lot of the boys came and brought bars of Clinique soap with, with bows tied around them to um, celebrate the book. So most people in the book are kind of made up characters, but Dr. McSwain was definitely himself. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit out of order, but you brought up Michael and Tony, and I loved that. So uh, 
so those of you listening, it's the part where uh, on call room, right? Where there's pinup girls and uh, tell us about how that felt. In the book, it's very funny. But when you walked into this call room where you're supposed to sleep and see posters of pinup girls and a hair in your Clinique soap, did you did you feel harassed? Did, how did that feel in real life? Well, I probably should have felt harassed. Um, but, you know, growing up on the farm, I had tons of cousins. And so, you know, the boys and the girls, we were constantly fighting and and our parents really didn't know where we were most of the time. And so I was kind of used to the rough and tumble world of, you know, people trying to get over on each other because that was pretty common on the front on the farm. We were not always terribly well supervised. And so, I mean, I didn't like seeing it, but it really didn't get to me very much. The first thing that came to my mind was how can I get them back? And so in real life, I told them that I wanted to bring something in, you know, that was my own. And they were terrified that I was gonna bring in naked man pictures because they were ill prepared to uh, deal with that. But then when I brought in a picture of a gorilla from when I had worked in Washington DC, they were kind of relieved. But some of the guys were uncomfortable and wanted to take them down, but most of them thought, you know, they needed that for inspiration, but they were not willing to have any naked men in there. (laughs) Did you consider yourself a feminist at the time? Did you consider that you were trailblazing for other women? I really didn't. Um, I was so busy working and everybody at charity was so busy working. I mean, the doctors and the nurses and the techs and the cleaning people. I mean, everybody was just working, 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 that there really wasn't a lot of time to think about how you felt about things. And that's one of the things that led to my writing is I wrote to process all the strong emotions for the things that happened that I saw when I was there. Yeah. So in the book, I, I was explaining this to a friend. There, there's so many like such intense emotional scenes. Um, and I'm thinking of the little league dad who dies, the woman who mm-hmm. the beautiful woman who attempts suicide. And and yet when you read the book, it's not I didn't cry as I read the book. How is it that you were able to keep your your sense of perspective when you're seeing um, some pretty horrific things as part of your your time at charity? I think people who have been to war and policemen and nurses and anybody who's ever worked in inner city hospital, things are happening so fast. And there are so many funny things and so many hideous things that something happens and you go, you deal with it. I mean, you don't really have time to have a lot of emotions. You know, first of all, you're trained. So they didn't let us loose on Charity Hospital until we had already done college and medical school. And, you know, we had had training. And so we had some idea of how to process this stuff. But basically, it's like any kind of job where you see a lot of really negative things. I mean, you hold it inside and you just keep going. It In earlier drafts of the book, um, did did you have to tone any of it down? Did your publisher uh, decide that any of it was a little too much for for general audiences? Because most of us aren't used to, you know, when I read those things in the book, of course, it's not part of my everyday experience. So was that something you had to temper? It was interesting. I definitely, the publisher did have me leave things out because the intensity of everything that folks saw at charity, it was too much for the lay public. I'm not a television watcher. So the last medical show that I saw on TV was MASH. So I haven't seen any of the last 30 years of of television shows about medicine. And apparently there's a lot of romance in there, which, you know, I didn't see too much of that at charity. We were too busy. You know, our clothes were all bloody and we had people's, you know, body parts hanging off of us (laughs) technically. But um, I forgot the question. Oh my God. <laughs> I would ask if you had to temper some of the very intense emotional uh, traumatic oh. experiences for the general audience. Yes, the publisher did take out some things that were just too much for people to, to deal with. Um, yeah. but I wanted to portray an accurate picture of it because I mean, anybody who's worked at an inner city hospital, these are their stories. It's not like these things just happened to me at Charity Hospital. Um, It happened to most people who've worked in a large inner city hospital anywhere. So these were kind of everybody's stories, not just my stories. 
Um, and you brought up, uh, I was also fascinated by the fact because, you know, I, ER, there's ER, of course, there's Chicago Hope, there's um, um, Grey's Anatomy, and yet your stories are different. They're not stories that I had, had seen um, on, on television. So it, it sort of makes sense that you hadn't seen those stories. So your stories were different. But when you think about, as I read your book, because I'd seen some of the doctor shows, I thought this would be a great movie or a great series. Had you thought about who might play some of the characters in the book? <laughs> so just like I don't watch TV, I don't go to the movies. So I don't know who any of the characters are. <laughs> yeah. um, in my fantasy, Tyler Perry, of course, you know, makes the movie. So if any of you know Tyler Perry, feel free to give him my phone number. And I see <laughs> Queen Latifah as Livy, the emergency room nurse. But the other characters, I don't really know who modern people are. So I, I, I don't really know. So, uh, so the casting call is open, I guess. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, so many, many things about the book are intriguing, but one of the really cool things to me was New Orleans is almost its own character in the book. I mean, not only the, of course, the title character is the hospital itself, but you also visit parts of the French Quarter. Is the is the French Quarter that was it that close to the hospital, and were you really able? Was that really a part of your life as it as it was in the book? Yeah, no, the French Quarter is within walking distance of um, what used to be Charity, and you know a lot of people like my friend Winky who worked at Tulane. I mean, they would walk from the quarter over to the medical school every day. So yeah, that that was pretty common. Um, the thing about New Orleans, when you're writing a novel, you have to create a world. And I, I see my friend Mike Brown on there, and he, he's written a bunch of novels. He's excellent. <laughs> Wave your hand so they know to look for you. But anyway, um, when you're creating a world, you need something to be in the world. And so in New Orleans, because of the richness of the music and the food and the culture, and it being a port city with the Mississippi River and all the good smells and bad smells and the contrast between up, uptown and the quarter and the ninth ward. I mean, there's just so much to be able to draw from to create a world in New Orleans in a novel. So you can really, you know, get the smells and the taste and the, and the culture and the architecture. Um, it's, a, it's a great city for writing fiction. Yeah, and it really comes alive in the book. I mean, you really, you really feel the atmosphere of New Orleans, and it brings up a great question about the voodoo in the book. Like several of your scenes involve patients who came in with voodoo remedies. That, does that happen anywhere but New Orleans? <laughs> I don't know, but um, anybody who's on the the call who worked at charity knows, you know, that there was always voodoo remedies around. And, you know, frequently you would offer them surgery or, well, not frequently, but sometimes you'd offer the patients surgery or some treatment and they'd, you know, opt to go and give a try to the voodoo person. And they'd come back in, you know, two, three months later and surprisingly their finger would be attached or whatever was wrong with them. <laughs> it looked pretty good. So I don't know if the body just healed itself or if the voodoo really worked, but yeah, we did see a, a bit of that. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, so you had, there was Joe's Bar, I think, and Fistula Cafe, or what you called, I'm probably mispronouncing it. Were those real places, or did you come up with those for the book? No, those are real places. Um, when you're a, a surgery resident, mostly what you're thinking about is food and sleep. And um, so the little area that was right outside of the front of, of Charity, we called it the Fistula, and the food actually wasn't that bad. And then Joe's was the local neighborhood school bar where both LSU and Tulane and all the people from charity would gather, you know, for, for drunken debauchery. Of course, I wasn't involved in any of that, but. Um. <laughs> you were too busy. <laughs> okay, so I've just got to talk about uh, Dr. McSwain because is he the one character in the book who, uh, who's a real life character? Is that yeah. right? Tell us about him. So if any of you have a chance to, to look at his obituary, his name's Dr. Norman McSwain, and he is a world-renowned, famous trauma surgeon. Um, he's passed now, but he, like many of my professors at Tulane, recognized that it was time for them to bring women into the fold in surgery. And he was a, a great supporter and a mentor. 
and he had the good sense to treat you know the women like everybody else which i think was important to our getting integrated into the world of surgery and dr mcswain um had been he and i had been corresponding long after i left new orleans and i would write stories about things that happened at charity and Dr. McSwain kept him in a big pile beside his chair in his home at the end of Bourbon Street, New Orleans. And he um, was pushing me to, to put my stories into a novel. After Katrina destroyed Charity, he was after me over and over. And by this time, I was like 57 years old. And my 70 something year old surgery professor is calling me and saying, you must write the book. And I'm completely anxiety stricken because I'm like, oh my God, my professor's telling me to do something. Never mind, it's 40 years later. And so I did, you know, start to write the book. And my husband and I had gone to New Orleans with the galley prince to have him approve it because he was the only person whose real name was going to be used in the book. And I wanted to make sure that he was okay with what was said and that it represented Tulane fairly accurately for the time. And my husband and I stood outside the Windsor Court in the rain waiting on him and he never came. And he was in the ICU at Tulane, he had had a stroke. So he never got to see the book. And I was very worried about putting his name in print on something that he had not actually seen the final copy. So I was kind of holding back from the printer, asking him you know, to wait, hoping that I would find someone from Dr. McSwain's family. He wasn't married or anything at that point. And what I didn't know was going on was his daughter, Mary, was going to his house on a daily basis and cleaning up things after he died. And she would pick up one of my stories off the stack that he had and read something about what had happened at Cherry. So I, my stories had become a part of her mourning process as she was dealing with the death of her father. And when she got to his computer, none of the stories had my name on them. So she didn't know who had written them. She just figured some student of his. When she got to his computer, she found some of the later stories and found my name on them. And she contacted me and I flew to New Orleans and we went to Mr. B's and had dinner. And she said it was very clear from daddy's emails that he wanted you to use his name in the book. So feel free to use it any way that you would like. And um, it was a really sweet kind of a thing because the stories helped her before it was ever even published. It's such an amazing story. It's so beautiful. Um, did he really regularly say, what have you done for humanity today? Was that, was that his tagline? Dr. McSwain, I mean, anybody who's on the call from charity knows he would show up for rounds and he'd go, okay, you, you knuckleheads, what have you done for <laughs> humanity today? And he would clap his hands and we'd start rounds. <laughs> and it was a reminder, you know, of what we were there for. It completely oriented us to, you know, you are here for the patients. I mean, you're here for your education, but you're here for the patients. So what you said about writing the stories and sending them uh, to Dr. McSwain, why, why did you feel compelled to write down the stories in the first place? Because it sounds like you didn't originally plan to write a book. You were just writing stories. I've written since I was a kid and I would write stories to process my emotions. When something happens in life, I kind of see it almost in story form. And um, I don't know if you guys have read much of uh, Isabella Lande, but I saw her at the History Center in Atlanta and she said that she used to be a journalist. And she said that her boss at the newspaper said, Isabel, you're always lying. You know, this is the news. You can't lie. And I have always wanted to lie. I mean, a story would happen and I would have to elaborate and add to it. And after a couple of weeks of telling the story, I wouldn't really know exactly what had happened. And so my brain thinks in this story form and makes up characters and adds to, I mean, I certainly can't write as well as Isabel Lande, even if I spent the rest of my life every day trying, but I thought that was a pretty good, um, you know, analogy for what happens with fiction writers. Cause you're basically making stuff up. Um, yeah. What has, um, what has surprised you about the reaction to the book? But what's, what's I thought, you know, when the publisher asked me when they published it, they said, who's going to be your audience? And so I thought it was going to be like maybe 40 to 65 year old female nurses. That's who I thought, you know, would would my book would appeal to. But I have had a big following with men 
And some of my most loyal readers are men. And some of the people who are hounding me the most for the next book are, are men. So, so that surprised me. Do you have more, more stories? Is there a sequel? <laughs> yeah, I'm about two thirds of the way through the sequel to this book. Um, it's going to be around 100,000 words, and I'm about 70,000 as of today. The, does the sequel also take place at charity? It's the next six months of the young doctor's uh, time in, in general surgery. Um, you mentioned that charity didn't exist after Katrina, and forgive me for not knowing the history, but what happened to charity after Katrina? What happened? That's a very good question. Um, I've asked a lot of people and I've gotten multiple answers, but basically the infrastructure was pretty much destroyed by the storm. And then when the money was given to either rebuild or do something else, the money was moved down the street um, to a new building. And um, that, that's as much as I know of what really happened. There's a lot of stories about what happened to the money and what happened to charity, but I don't really know. But it's not a working hospital and, and really never will be again. Have you found um, a, a lot of people who have been drawn to the book who trained at charity or worked at charity and, and have reminisced with you about what happened there? Yeah. A lot of people have uh, told one another and passed it along and um, yes, lots of folks from charity. And it's been a, a bit of a healing thing for a lot of people because they've kind of been able to revisit it and it's brought up some of their stories of things that happened, you know, when they were there. So yeah, it's been kind of like you've a long week. Yeah, you've answered this a, a little bit already, right? Because you've always enjoyed writing stories, but how did you go from busy surgeon to author. How did that transition, transformation take place? Well, Dr. McSwain was breathing down my back. And one thing that surgery prepares you for is discipline. You, you learn to discipline yourself because your life is run by the surgery schedule. And so if you have to do surgery on somebody, you can't just say, I don't feel like it today. So I started getting up at four o'clock in the morning. And so between four and about five or 5.30, I would write every day until I got the first draft done. And then I hired an editor to work with me. And that was very traumatic because I did not like seeing all those red marks, you know, on my, on my papers. I really enjoyed writing for myself. That was, that was the fun part most of the years. But then when I tried to make this into something that someone else could read and understand who was not necessarily a medical person, that's when the real work began. And we you know, had to do multiple edits to, to get it readable for other people. Um, how did you go about getting it published? How did you find a publisher, get it published? This was a crazy situation. Um, when I started talking about the book, two different patients were in my office who were actual published authors. And they mentioned my story to their publishers. And this is completely not what usually happens in publishing, but two publishers contacted me. And when my husband and I had um, put the early drafts into the Library of Congress to be, um, you know, kept there so that, so that it couldn't be copied, um, people were actually looking for books to publish. I think that the publishing industry has changed a bit because of you know, Amazon doing so much. And so some of the smaller publishers were actually looking for material. And so I used something that's called a hybrid um, publishing company. When you're an unknown author, you have to basically do everything yourself. I mean, unless you're Delia Owens, you know, nobody's doing anything for you. And, and Mike can tell you that for sure, that you, know, you have to do everything yourself. So a, a hybrid publisher, they don't really do a whole lot for you other than give you a quality book. And you're pretty much responsible for getting the word out there. You mentioned uh, how difficult it was to see you know, red marks on your transcript. What part has been the hardest about having your work reviewed <laughs> online because you can't really control right who writes an Amazon review and from what I've seen it's overwhelmingly positive I'm, I'm sure not everyone you know thinks it's five million stars what has been the hardest part about that or what's, what is that experience like well I was 
I was prepared for people to be um, critical because I mean, this is my first novel. How could I possibly come right out of the shoot and not have a dud? So I guess I was kind of, you know, prepared. And after you revise your book about 20 times, you cannot see what is in there anymore. I mean, you read a page and you cannot see it. You're just like, oh my God, what is this? You know, take this away. But um, the, I had some funny reviews. I mean, I had one poor guy, God bless him. He raked me over the coals. And when I looked to find out who he was, it was somebody I had told I couldn't go to the prom with like 40 years ago. And another lady went on there and just gave me the business. And it turned out she and I had been vying for the same fella. And he liked me better than he liked her. And that was about 30 years ago. And I don't think either one of them had read the book. They were just like, you know, she's terrible. She's awful. You know, we hate her, blah, blah, blah. So I got some laughs out of it. But I belong to something called the Atlanta Writers Club. And it's, it's a writing club that's been around since like the early 1900s. And some of my friends from there gave me some honest criticism that was very, very helpful, which I think will improve, you know, my next books that I'm writing. If you were to go back and rewrite the book today, what would you change? What would you have done differently? I don't know. I, you know, it's been several years, so I, I can't really say what I would do differently. But if anybody has any good ideas, put them in the chat because I'll use them on the next book. Is there anything that was left out of the book or edited out of the book that you wish had been left in? No. no. I think they did a great job. Yeah. Um, what? How is a doctor uniquely qualified or or how, how is a doctor uniquely qualified to write, do you think? Or are they? I think so. I mean, um, Dr. Thomas can certainly tell you, people tell us all their most intimate thoughts and feelings. I mean, uh, no matter what kind of doctor you are, people come to you and they're scared and they'll tell you things that they wouldn't necessarily tell anybody else. And so you get a view into the human psyche and then when you work in surgery or you work in an emergency room or you work in the hospital, you know, all kinds of things happen. So you see people at their worst, you know, they're, they're scared and, you know, sometimes they're mean and sometimes they're aggressive. And then sometimes you see greatness. I mean, you see people that persevere and family members who persevere through the, the worst things. And so you get a glimpse at the greatness of the average guy. And if you work in a high pressure situation and you do your duty, I mean, it will break your heart a thousand times. And by cracking open your own heart, and your own psyche, you have a lot of material to write about. Let's talk about heart. So there were several, you know, you mentioned the commander's palace scene, right? Where she goes with Dr. Caballero and falls asleep in her food. And um, I sense a little attraction to Dr. White, which may or may not be there, but the way she, Elizabeth in the book describes Dr. White, I think, oh, she's got a crush on him. But there's not a lot of romance in the book. I, do you plan <laughs> romance for the sequel? You know, or are there gonna be any sex scenes in the next book? So I just got to know and a writer's club that have given me some honest critique have said, you know, it's not normal for a woman in her 20s to not be having sex and not have a boyfriend. And, you know, I'm like, well, the truth is I suck at writing romance. And so they recommended I read Danielle Steele and try to get some ideas from her. And, you know, she's a good writer, but I just can't do that romance stuff. So there's definitely going to have to be some romance in the next book. But um, that's going to probably be the hardest part for me. I can write the drama and the trauma, but you know, the romance, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. How did you, um, how, a little bit different topic. How did you end up in neurology? How did you choose? You're one of the first uh, 100 female urologists in the world. Oh my gosh. It, it's almost unimaginable. How, how did you choose that particular specialty? So when I was a young woman, I was a real tree hugging granola, save the whales, you know, I'm gonna go out there and save everybody. So my first love was wildlife biology. And that was actually what I was studying. And I went to Washington DC and learned that, you know, the government was not particularly interested in wildlife. They were more interested in money. 
And so I came back to my college and I was very disillusioned. And my professor said, well, my advisor said, well, why don't you just go to medical school? So I went to medical school thinking that maybe I'd join the Peace Corps and I'd be a family practice doctor and I'd go to Africa. And I rotated on surgery and all of a sudden I found this talent. I was like better at this than the other kids. And this male surgeon whose wife was a, in the department of OBGYN said, you know, hey, you're, you're really good at this. You know, maybe you should consider this. And so I had not considered it at all. And so they were talking to me about possibly doing hand surgery. They said, you know, with your eye hand coordination and um, all that, you know, maybe you'd be really good at doing hand surgery. So when we signed up for the rotation, I got put in urology and I was very upset. I went to the dean and I was like, please give me anything other than that P service. I do not want to be in service. And he's like, I'm sorry, honey, but you know, we had a lottery and you're going to be on urology for a month. And the first week I was very agitated. I didn't want anything to do with it. And then by the second week, I realized they did surgery on kids, adults, there was cancer surgery, there was intersex surgery. And so I realized how interesting it was. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll be a urologist not knowing anything about it. So I went to visit the chairman and he goes, we don't really take women in urology. And I walked out of his office and I thought, oh, you need some women in urology. And so that was kind of it. I was like, huh, no women in urology. So y'all probably need some. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, you consider, your, I think I asked this before, but I'll ask it again. Do you consider yourself a feminist? Because that was trailblazing. You said, okay, there aren't any women in urology. My gosh and golly, I'm going to do it. Is that a feminist? I mean, I feel like surgery was hard on everybody. I feel like charity was tough on everybody. I feel like that inner city, you know, all that was just tough. And I don't think it was any harder on me than it was on anybody else. And I feel like having spent summers on the farms, you know, I was used to hard work and I was used to anybody does whatever, you know, comes up if you're physically capable of doing it. So if the pig gets out of the, the pen, nobody's asking, are you a girl cousin or a boy cousin? It's like, hey, you're closest to the pig, get the pig. And so, um, you know, I, I really, my family didn't raise me to think about things like that. It was like, if you can do the job, you do the job. Now, guaranteed, there were plenty of guys in surgery who were really not anxious to have women. And also they didn't really know how to incorporate us into surgery. And I'll tell you one story. This is a true story that's not in the book. And um, it'll give you an idea of what it was like. So I was rotating and I had, there were two guys in the call room that I was sharing call with. And we were constantly playing jokes on each other. And I had gotten over on one of them because he was basically telling three different nurses that he loved them. And so I was laying in the bed at night in the call room, listening to him call these different girls and tell them he loved them. And so I busted his butt and told the women, you know, he, he doesn't love any of y'all. He's telling all y'all the same thing. So he was in the revenge mode. So I got paged to go to the chairman's office and I went over there and what the chairman was calling me for was to talk about the Christmas party. He wanted to let me know that they were trying to figure out a way to include me in the Christmas scene because it had always been like drunken debauchery. The guys would go down into the French Quarter, they'd get drunk out of their minds, they'd go to the strip clubs. And now that they had, you know, women in the program, they had to do something else. But he was trying to, to thread that eye of the needle between getting me to be included versus making it so that all their fun was taken away because now they had a woman. And so he was explaining to me about the party and, and how we were gonna have a nice dinner and all this stuff. And my pager goes off and it's this turd from the uh, call room and it goes, we're in the call room and our pants are off. And we had these, these uh, pagers that were about this big and they were like a speaker. You could hear them two blocks away. So the chairman pretends like nothing's happening and he starts talking again. And the thing goes off and it says, we're in the call room and our pants are off. And they knew I was over there with the chairman and they were, they were disguising their voices. And so um, <laughs> I go to pull out, I don't know if you guys remember those little daytimer things, those little leather things that you would carry around in your pocket with the, with the dates and everything. So I go to pull that thing out and they have packed my pocket with condoms. And so these condoms go flying up in the air and I see it drift down onto the top of his wingtips. And at this point, he's like, oh my God. And he just looks at me and goes, honey, 
I'm glad you enjoyed Tulane. And he turned around and went back in his office. And this guy, you know, came to be almost like a father to me. I mean, he was a mentor, almost like a father, but, you know, he was trying to figure out how to do it. And, um, but I don't think it was anything particularly against me. I think it was just charity was rough and tumble and there was a lot happening. Um, but uh, then the, I, I have a thicker skin than a lot of people, so. Yeah. Um, so in the, you know, it's clear in the book and it's clear from talking with you that charity was a very special place. And um, you know, just, you really were thrown into things, right? And now that charity, is gone is are there other hospitals like charity do you think or, or that you know of or was that like a unique uh place at a unique time i mean my personal prejudice is that it was a unique place at a unique time i mean one of the things i wanted to show in the book was how amazing the nurses were because anybody who's been in medicine for very long knows that if you have a quality hospital, it's because you have quality nurses. They are the patient's advocate. They are the people who are there 24 hours a day. They are the ones who run the show. I also wanted to show how the experienced nurse was protecting the patient from the new doctor. You know, you come out of medical school and you're all full of, you know, pardon my language, piss and vinegar, and you think you know everything. And then you get there and, you know, you've got a lot of book knowledge, but the nurses have a lot of practical knowledge. And so the doctors who are most successful would partner with the nurses and kind of tuck themselves under their wing and learn from them. The ones who were all interested in being the big boss and, you know, I'm the doctor and, you know, doctor's orders and all that crap, you know, they, they had a lot tougher road. And so I really wanted to, to show in the book how important the nurses are to the whole system. And I think in charity, you know, they were the people who were there year after year, the security people, the African-American ladies who ran the elevators, those nurses in those trauma suites and those ERs, I mean, they were as good as 90% of the doctors in America, no joke. And most of them could have been the doctor and would have been the doctor if they had not, you know, had family reasons or financial reasons or, you know, whatever else. I mean, these, the, the quality of women who were nurses from about the 40s through the 90s, I mean, most of them that I ever came across could have been the doctor. Well, let's talk about, okay, my favorite nurse in the book is Lavinia Robichaux. I think you said you Queen Latifah would be a good uh, actress to play her. So um, did, did she exist? And if, if yeah, so, what was your relationship like? <laughs> she's an amalgamation of all the great nurses I've ever known. I mean, she's a little bossy. She's, you know, a uh, little grumpy, but she's a patient advocate. And as long as you're doing what you need to do for the patient, you're going to get along with her. And if you don't, she's going to turn you into the big boss who was Dr. McSwain. And, you know, in teaching hospitals, the nurses are kind of like spies too. You know, they, they know the attendings and the, the upper level residents. And if you're an intern and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, the nurses would turn you in. So, um, so she's an amalgamation of a lot of people. So uh, those of us who have read the book, and if you haven't, you'll love the characters. And one of them is, your, is a, I keep saying your, Elizabeth's neighbor in the book, who is quite the character. Uh, was was that your neighbor in New Orleans, or did you feel you had to bring in some real life just to have some scenes outside of the hospital? They were completely made up. It was just she had to have, just like she needed a romance life. She had to have some place to live so outside of the hospital because she didn't sleep every night in charity. So that was all. Made so Buster the Chihuahua wasn't saved in real life. <laughs> No, but one of the things that was amazing to me when I went to charity was how many places people could stuff Mardi Gras beads. I mean, they were in their noses, their ears, they choked on them, they swallowed them, they breathed them down, the children had them in their vagina and their anus. I mean, I've never seen so many Mardi Gras beans and beads in so many places. And so I figured, you know, we'd have the dog choke on a Mardi Gras bead. <laughs> was that, um, 
Was that your editor coming in and saying, okay, we, we're spending too much time at the hospital. We've got to get out in the French Quarter because the scenes there are amazing too. We've got to get you know, into the neighborhood and see what your neighbor would be like. Or was that just your normal progression of, of writing and deciding, hey, we need different venues? Yeah, that was, that was my writing. I mean, what the editor really did was say, you know, I can't see this. I'm not a nurse, I'm not a doctor, I can't see this, so I need more description. Or say to me, you know, this is too much. I've been crying for two days, you gotta take this out. So um, those kinds of things, yeah. I can definitely see that because as we discussed previously, some of the scenes, uh, some of the traumatic scenes are quite traumatic then you you seem to turn it's not like I was crying reading the book right it, it, it all seems to have a sense of hope um, was is is Elizabeth you I mean I know the stories are based on real life is Elizabeth you Elizabeth for those of you who may not have read the book yet is the main character in the book for the most part yeah um, I was probably not as not as shy as her but for the most part yeah did you wear pearls to, oh, yeah. to trade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did show up in that outfit. That's exactly what happened that first day. I mean, I was coming from Charleston, South Carolina. So I was trying to dress for success. I had a pink bow in my hair. I had on pink Argyle socks. I mean, I was a little Miss Charleston. So yeah. How many the other women were like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I see some bums up in the, in the people watching. Um, so how many women were there with you? I know you, you know, it, it, you shared an on-call room with two guys who put up pinup posters. How many, were there other women there at all? And why didn't they put you together in on-call room, on-call rooms with the other women? So I, I never saw another woman urologist until I was a woman urologist. So Urology was 98% male worldwide, and it's 96% male worldwide. Um, and so there were, I think, two other women in general surgery, but they would spread us out into different rotations. So we were usually not at the same place at the same time. That, that just amazes me. But, um, well, it changed a great deal. I mean, the, the chair of Tulane surgery is now a woman. And, you know, she's a great doctor and I've gotten to know her when she's come to Atlanta, we've had dinner. So things are not like they were back then. I mean, it's, it's evolved enormously. Um, you know, Charity's not a hospital anymore and Tulane surgery is run by females. So it's, it's a different world these days. So I'm looking in the chat and uh, one person watching has said that they're going to serve cream puffs. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the book, Elizabeth is called Cream Puff by Nurse Robichaux because she comes in with, you know, she's dressed in pink with a pink bow and and, uh, and pearls. Were you called Cream Puff? Where did the Cream Puff come from? I don't know. Out of my crazy brain. Yeah? Yeah. No, that never happened. That was just totally. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, I know what I need to ask. Martha, what haven't I asked that people would like to know or you would like to answer? What haven't I asked that should be asked? So this is kind of a funny story. Um, everybody in the book had either consented to be in the book or um, had been very much changed so that nobody would know who they were. There was only one character that I was worried about and that was Dr. White. And because he was kind of a villain in the book, um, I was worried, you know, what he was gonna have to say. And I was about three months into the process of going around and giving book talks and nobody had mentioned him. So I thought, you know, he probably, this is not on his radar, he hasn't read it, so I'm okay. So I was back in the office one day and I was waiting for a call from a radiologist who had a name that was similar to the real Dr. White. And my nurse said, you know, hey, get on the phone. Dr. So and says on the phone. And I thought she was talking about the radiologist. So I picked up the phone and he goes, hello, Elizabeth, it's Dr. White. And so my knees kind of buckled because uh, this guy was scary smart and I really did not want him to be upset. And the next thing he said was, you really got Charity and you really got Dr. McSwain. 
And then he gave me a few compliments about the book and I was kind of happy. And then towards the end of the conversation, he goes, so do I get any better in the next book? And I said, um, what do you think? And he's like, can you be bribed? <laughs> I was like, no, I think you're going to get a little worse in the next book. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Clark asks, what was Dr. McSwain's first reaction to your first story? So I guess the first time you sent Dr. McSwain a story, what was his reaction? So Dr. McSwain was on a plane going to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Secretary of the Navy. At that time, he was working on teaching our Navy SEALs how to take care of themselves in the field. And he said that um, he busted out laughing. And so as soon as he landed at Reagan Airport, he um, called me and he said, you know, this is great. Keep them coming. And I mean, the story was not edited. It was, it was a story about a lady who um, her child had had surgery at charity and the, and the wound had broken open. And the lady had called in the middle of the night on the call line at charity. And, and she said, my baby's guts is in the bed and I'm coming down there and you're gonna have to pay my cab fee. So it was a story about that. And I had apparently gotten the story, you know, fairly accurate and he thought it was funny and it kind of demonstrated, you know, the relationship between some of the patients. Some of our patients were not real happy to be our patients. And um, that was kind of a demonstration of that. And, and that was the first time I sent him something and he liked it. It's raining so hard here that I can barely hear you, believe it or not. It's, oh. uh, <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear the rain behind me. So um, anyone else have some questions? You can either unmute yourself or type your question in the chat. Oh, wait, here we go. Here's another one. Why didn't you include mention of Muffaletta's Genuine Nola Cuisine? And that's from TM Brown. So as an intern, I didn't have any money. We were, we were paid like $19,000 a year. So we weren't eating out anywhere. But actually, in the book I'm writing now, I did write a scene about a muffalata in the central grocery store about a week ago. So you're going to see a little bit more food in the next book. But it was not consistent with her being a starving, you know, intern. She was kind of eating in the basement in the cafeteria most of the time. <laughs> but that's well, a good and idea. I, get I think that's a very good idea. We could have a, a big free cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, people are saying um, they can't wait for the next book. They're they're encouraging that. When do you think the next book will be out? I don't know. The um, publisher has about a year turnaround date. So it just depends on how bad it is and how many times it has to be edited. So I'd say <laughs> maybe a year, year and a half. Uh, someone is asking, what about the adoption of Elizabeth? Adoption of Elizabeth. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, so yes, in the book, Elizabeth was adopted, and we kind of oh 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 that's yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. and um, it, in the book, we, it kind of alludes to the fact that maybe she and her mother didn't have the greatest relationship, and her mother was not necessarily delighted for her to be a doctor. And was not really delighted for her to be in New Orleans. She was more interested in her being staying at home you know, marrying a local farmer and um, being there to take care of her as she got older. So, but that was just kind of glossed over in the book. Yeah. Um, did you bring up physical attacks in and out of the hospital? How did you handle that as a doctor and her and safety in New Orleans? Well, this is one of the things that the publisher wanted me to take out of the book. Um, the first case that I scrubbed on at Charity Hospital, I walked in and the table was covered in guns. And I mean, I was just this little innocent hick from South Carolina. And I was like, oh my God, the guy you're operating on had all those guns. And anesthesia looks over the, the drape and goes, honey, those are the doctor's guns. And I was like, whoa. And you know, over the next six years, I got mugged three times. And one time was in the hospital by a patient. So um, there was a lot to process. I mean, there, there was a t-shirt going around charity for a while that said, the life you save may take your own. And when I first saw it, I thought that was kind of insensitive, but the longer I was there, the more I realized, yeah, that was a possibility. Walking around charity at night was rough. 
Wow, that, that is amazing to hear. Um, don't forget drug reps brought lunch from mothers. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> I'm not right. sure what that means. So you'll have to explain that one. That's right. <laughs> um, um, you know, the drug reps would bring food sometimes to people at charity and they would bring the local food. So we would, we would get a taste of the local food. Okay. Hey, Martha. hey uh, Martha, I just wanted, I have to share this with you. I don't, we haven't had a chance to talk to you. You've been running all over God's creation since you closed your practice. Um, um, for everybody listening, Martha made her books available for a reading group that I do with senior citizens here in Newton, Georgia. And this group is made up of predominantly um, 80 to 90 year old women. Um, and I'm reading The Big Free. And one of the early scenes is uh, Elizabeth uh, joining the nun uh, for the uh, <clears throat> inspection and the scenes. And trying to read that. Now, reading it with your, you know, you you reading it in the books, one thing. Reading it out loud to about 15 older women and trying to share the, the, the scene with these women is crazy. And I was blushing probably more than they were. Um, and the other scene was the scene at the VA hospital when you were, te you know, the Elizabeth, you, Elizabeth was teaching you know, how to do a proper exam, you know, and <laughs> so both of those scenes were more embarrassing to me, but it was a fun read and we all ended up laughing. So, it, you know, read uh, Martha's books, one thing to yourself, but to read it out loud to somebody else without blushing is extremely <laughs> difficult. I promise you. Um, Martha's a good friend and I really appreciate it. In fact, she did that and allowed those books to be read like that. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Both of those stories happened. Those are those were not from my imagination. Those were things that really happened. And he's talking about Sister Marion. So anybody who trained at charity might have known Sister Marion, who ran the urology clinic. And then um, the gentleman from the VA hospital. He was he was a real person too. He's he's not with us anymore. But so any of you guys looking for a good book to read, remember this guy's name, T. M. Brown. He's got some good books out there. So if you're looking for a good read, check out his stuff. Someone is asking if you anymore. someone is asking if you had to deal with corruption in New Orleans. Oh my gosh. If, if you ever went to the motor vehicle or the post office, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't think of any time I didn't deal with corruption in Louisiana. I mean, just read about the history of the place. Huey Long. Um, oh, yeah, it was it's very corrupt. It always has been. It has a history of corruption. Uh, from Mike Pouillet, remember me, I was there with you. So, yeah, if you want to say something, you'll have to unmute yourself. I'm trying. I like your shirt. <laughs> Yay. Thank you for joining us. I'm sorry we can't hear you. Hey, Mike, I'm trying to unmute you. I think, uh, I think you have to unmute yourself. Here I am. There you are. There I am. Hey. Hey. I thought you were the Martha that I remember from Charleston. Yes. <laughs> I married the OBGYN resident. Maybe you were talking about me. <laughs> were you at Charity or Charleston? Charity. Oh, yeah. So now this guy. I'm a McSwain boy. Look. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I love that. Can you I'm a McSwain boy, too. And I see Dr. McFadden is down here on the list. Oh, excellent. Another Tulane product. Great. So. Did you guys read the book or not yet? I haven't got it. I just ordered it. I hadn't got it yet. I'd love to know what you think yeah. about the stories. And if you have any that you think would be good in the next um, in the next book, please let me know. There's some orthopedic guys trying to put together charity stories. Yeah, Bo, Bo Frederick and those guys. Yeah. I think they were putting together true charity stories. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. You start with the true ones and fix them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll mute myself. I'm, I'm, I'll start listening. Thank nice. you for being here. Good to see you. It's been too long. It's good to see you too. All right, you guys, does anyone else want to ask a question while we're here? Or uh, any remembrances, that sort of thing. Go ahead. My husband has a question here. Go ahead. Hon. Hey, uh, Martha, um, I'm, now I, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm going to look forward. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, some of the stories that were edited out were pretty interesting. They're darker, I'm gathering. Um, is you know, the, the stories, even the, the, in a funny way, but in a sort of a weird way, the, you know, condoms lying on top of the wingtips of your, the chief of the hospital, the chief surgeon, the uh, story of uh, the guns. Uh, it, are you thinking maybe this could be a little darker? I mean, it, if it, without it being, um, uh, you know, and, and still have the, the optimism that it sounds like you, that, that I know, that, that I know of you, but also it sounds like it's in the book, you know, willing to kind of go that way. A little bit. I think that the, the publisher was trying to um, moderate it so that it wasn't so up and down and up and down and up and down. He was trying to get, you know, more of a plot. And it's basically a coming of age story. You know, it's a young naive girl who at the end of the book is not as naive and recognizes that she's used everything she's learned in her hometown basically to survive what she's going through now. And so I think those repetitive hits of all those things that happen at charity, I think it just took the reader's emotions too far down and took away from the general theme of, you know, it's up and it's down, it's up and it's down, but it's a basically a coming of age story. And so I think that he thought that they kind of, those more hideous parts kind of took away from, from the general trend of the story, the plot of the story. So, so in the new book, where do you think it may be, uh, how, how may it evolve from, from the so I've got some new characters. Um, I'm exploring the Cajun culture a little bit more. I've got a couple of crazy Cajuns in there. Um, they're a little bit more at Tulane and not as much at Charity. And um, Dr. White is, is prominent in the, in the new book. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question from the chat. Martha, did you ever get too personally connected with the patient? and try, trying to help them outside of your medical role at the hospital. Oh yeah, I would give people, uh, I would buy people's medications for them at charity and the nurses did that all the time. I mean, those charity nurses would be helping people with all kinds of stuff all the time. You know, a ride, food. Um, some of those nurses yeah. were just amazing how selfless they were for the patients. And you know, I did some of that. Um, you know, certainly all medical people, I mean, sometimes you're just really touched by somebody and you, you befriend them and you help them outside of the system. So, yeah, I mean, the people that showed up at charity for the most part, they didn't have anything. I mean, so many of them just had nothing and, you know, follow up care and quality of care after they left the hospital was, was hard to come by. Question here. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's got a question. Um, I, I uh, completed my residency at Charity Hospital in 1974 uh, in thoracic uh, surgery. Um, and I, I would ask the doctor if she's had an opportunity to read the recent book of Dr. Jim Sheravella, who wrote uh, um, uh, an account of our experiences, firsthand experiences. Nonfiction, uh, nonfiction, if you would, um, perhaps it'd be an opportunity for the two of you to collaborate on a, the next effort to uh, give credit to Charity Hospital and all the people that worked there and did what they did. I am so glad you mentioned that. I was actually on Zoom when he was doing his talk at the Garden District book bookstore. 
Um, those people were very nice to me about my book. And so when I, when I, when they notified me about his book, I ordered one immediately and I'm waiting for it to come. I ordered it about two weeks ago and it should be here like any day, but I listened to his lecture about his writings at charity on the garden district bookstore. And so I can't wait to, um, get it. If you, um, wouldn't mind typing in the chat his name and the name of his book for anybody else who's interested in it, because I, I can't wait to get it. And I think the idea of contacting him is an excellent one. I, I thank you for that. Thank you. He said, it's still sweet. It's a natural sweetener, but it's still sweet. Aren't you afraid that? And don't tell Marianne, me. I think you muted yourself. I did. Before we get too far away from it, I just wanted to say there is in the in the current book, Nurse Robichaud pays for patient care and that sort of thing. Um, people have indicated they'd love to hear more about that sort of thing in the next book. Um, all right. Uh, Martha, is there anything else we need to uh, say before we sign off? Or is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? I'm open for any questions oh. or comments. <laughs> right, ben has a question. Martha, it's a pleasure okay. to see you and talk to you and listen to your, your writing. Yeah. Um, you know, there were so many patients that oh, I remember I sending you over the years, but okay. uh, a couple uh, stand out. One was a young boy who had a urethral injury in an automobile accident. And he was one of the most interesting patients I've ever seen because he would, uh, he was paid to go into businesses and break into their computers. And I can't remember exactly the details, but you saw him. And it was a complication that you felt was best seen by one of your Emory uh, urology associates. And you sent him over there and he came back and he said, I just wish Dr. Boone could have done my procedure because she was my favorite doctor. Oh. And it was just, it was delightful. He was a young guy and delightful. He told me in one of his trips to a bank, he said he, he pretended to be a janitor and he got a, a broom and a, a dustpan and he said he needed to come in and clean up. And they let him into the, <laughs> I keep forgetting, uh, which which bank in San Francisco? And he said, I got everything they had on their computers, and they went completely crazy. And he just died laughing. He thought that was hilarious. And they have to leave soon. I love that story. The second one too. was you came into my office one day, and you were working for a pharmaceutical rep. And I remember you sat down, and the first thing you said, Do you have a piece of paper? <laughs> I said, Yeah. And you drew a kidney. And I said, that is amazing. <laughs> and I wondered if you are an artist besides just simply being a writer. Has that ever? No, I must have been you? trying to calm my own anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so impressive. It's great. And all my you. patients loved you. And I'm sure we and all of them will love your book. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Fun. Thank you. Hey, Martha, I want to introduce myself. I'm Faye's girlfriend out here in Dallas. I'm Robin. Oh my Martha. God, hey Robin. It's so nice to meet you. And I'm reading the book. I'm just a few chapters in, but I'm hooked and I'm really looking forward to the whole story and the next book. And I want to meet you someday when I come to Atlanta. You know, all my family is there. I grew up in Atlanta. So I will uh, get your contact info from Faye. We'll, oh, that we'll sounds great. You should together. both come. All right. Well, it seems like we've come to a natural end just about after a full hour of great discussion. Martha, thank you so much for doing this. this is yeah. great. And uh, thank you everybody who came to participate and listen in. And uh, if you haven't gotten your copy yet, order it now, order multiple copies. They're great gifts. And it's just a wonderful story. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you. And if any of you have any organizations that you would like for me to speak, um, I'm happy to do it. You know, I do book clubs. I do, I mean, Zoom book clubs are easy. I don't even have to comb the back of my hair, but I do in-person stuff too. So well, we want you to come to our writing group. 
Okay. okay. Let, just let me know about it. And, okay. um, you know, even in Louisiana, I'm happy to come to Louisiana. I do, I've done like four book events in um, one in Baton Rouge and three in New Orleans. So I'm happy to, to do any of that if any of you have book clubs or organizations. So I, I have one more question. Marianne, how did you get involved with this interview? Uh, well, I've, I've known Martha for a while and I love her and I love the book. And I said, hey, why don't we do a Zoom discussion? And then we decided why not open it up to different people who might be interested. So, yeah. You're a great interviewer. Well, thank you. <laughs> she, she was a former news She's a former news anchor. She's been in the media for years. And she's a lawyer oh, yeah. and she's a real estate agent. She's oh, oh wow. How what she's all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Thank you. That and 25 cents won't buy you a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> she and Martha are the two smartest women I know, people I know. Wow. Well, you haven't met me yet. <laughs> That's right. There That's you right. go. You knock us off that totem pole. Boom. There you go. <laughs> this was awesome. To you. Thank you so much. And Catherine, thank you for joining us. Catherine is from my ARNC book club. And oh. we've had Martha in to do a presentation. And it was phenomenal. We still oh. talk about it. Right. Mm. Oh, and I've okay. got you booked. I've, I've just sent your stuff information, Martha, to the Roswell Women's Club. Yeah, because it, I'm amazed at Martha's presentation. I'm going to have to get the book now. Thank you, Shanta, for sharing it with me. It was fantastic. I, it makes me want to read it now. Good. Thank yeah. you. All about charity in New Orleans. Yes. Thank you. Martha. Of course, we'll all look forward to the next book as well. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, thank, thank you all. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you all very much. Good night. Bye. Good night. That was great.